I was up at a DFL picnic function in uh, Anoka County, and a guy said to me, you know, Rukavina, I watch you on TV, and I like you, and I want to vote for you. Because you kind of remind me of the love child between Paul Wellstone and Jesse Ventura. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of made me shudder at first a little bit. I can see you're doing the same. But, you know, I kind of knew what he was saying, that I can connect to the most progressive voter in this state and the most independent blue-collar voter that our party has been losing. It's been 20 years since we've had a Democratic farmer labor governor in this state. I'll tell you why I'm running for, the, for governor. You know, I love this state, and I just hate what Tim Pawlenty has done to it. And somebody's got to fix it. You know, uh, I carry around this brochure in my pocket, and I've carried it, and I've got it, by the way, from a good old uh, a Finn on the Iron Range. His name was Knut Satanimi. And years ago, he gave me the original copy of uh, the 1938 platform for the Farmer Labor Party. And I come... And I proudly say I'm from the farmer labor wing of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. But if you look at this pamphlet from 1938, it's absolutely the same argument that's going on at the Capitol today. The uh, pamphlet talks about how the Republicans were attacking the Farmer Labor Party because... Uh, are you a Republican blogger, by the way? You know? No. Oh, okay. okay. No, I'm just asking. Because I say the same thing everywhere, but that's okay. Uh, you know, the pamphlet says that it's not a fight about uh, spending because the Republican-controlled Senate signed every spending bill. It's a fight over who's going to pay the taxes. Well, what happened at the Capitol this year? Governor Pawlenty signed every spending bill and then vetoed the tax bill because for him it was a fight over who he wants to pay the bill. So, uh, you know, uh, I really enjoy taking on, and I have taken on Governor Pawlenty when he was the majority leader. Uh, I, I kind of kick him around as much as I can uh, today, and I think what he's done to this state is terrible. I'm glad he's going to be leaving. You know, I'm a blue-collar worker. i got to tell you a little more history about myself. I graduated from the University of Minnesota at Duluth. Got a BA in political science and a minor in history. But I wanted to be a union organizer. And so I went to the Steelworkers uh, District 11 office in Duluth, and I told the then president or the director of District 11, which included the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, a number of other states, that I wanted to be a union organizer. And he said to me, kid, then go up and work in the mines. So that's what I did. I went up, I became a steel worker like my father and grandfather. I drove a truck for many years. I had my own logging business. Uh, I know what it's like to not have much money. I know what it's like to not have health insurance. And I've carried all of those different uh, memories to the Capitol and been a fighter for, for people that just, like I said earlier, nobody fights for. I've carried the prevailing wage bills that have kept the wages of all of us, I think, uh, uh, up where they should be. And I've been a strong proponent of made in America, union-made products at the Capitol. If you look at my brochures, you'll see that. And I think one of the problems with this country today is we have outsourced all of our manufacturing jobs, uh, and we just can't have a service industry. We have to, have, we have to create wealth. 20% of our economy is still agricultural. It's the wealth from the land. And I live in an area that, you know, we don't farm... Uh, the land, we farm rocks and we farm trees, but we create, create wealth for this country. Well, I mentioned earlier that I'm from the farmer labor wing of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, and I still believe that the fairest tax is the income tax. Now, we lost about a billion dollars a year uh, in when we cut income taxes in 2000, 1999 and 2000. I will venture to say that most people in this bar this evening do not recall getting any more money on their check when those income taxes were cut. But just let me give you an indication that the 50 richest people, I had the House Independent Research, this is not Republicans or Democrats, do the uh, checking for me. And, uh, the richest 50 Minnesotans who collectively in 2005 made 
$1.7 billion together, 50 people, 50 families, uh, got $12 million a year back from that income tax cut. Now, I don't know if it's because they couldn't pay their electric bill or what the reason why was, but, you know, it's not fair that when we cut income taxes, we started doing fees, whether they're alcohol fees, they're the... Uh, the cigarette fee that the governor uh, implemented a few years ago is really a tax. Fees have become taxes. Fees used to be because you got a service. But now we're calling everything a fee at the Capitol so somebody can keep a no new tax pledge. And it's, I want to be upfront and straightforward with people. We can balance this budget and in years past we have by putting a surcharge on income tax that goes away when we get back on our feet. El Qui did it. El Cui had made a no new tax pledge in 1981, and when he realized that he couldn't keep it in 1982, you know, the DFL-controlled legislature had some guts that year and stayed there until December 31st. And Governor Cui finally compromised. And I talked to Governor Cui about this, and he said I had to make a decision to keep a pledge or to destroy this state. And I figured I wouldn't de destroy the state. I'd break my pledge and I wouldn't run again. He agreed to an income tax surcharge that did disappear when Rudy Perpich had come back and got reelected, and they increased the sales tax a little bit. I'm not going to do that because I think sales taxes are unfair, and I'll keep an open mind and look at that. But to me, the income tax is still the fairest tax. And I think whether you're a fiscal conservative or an ultra-liberal, a surcharge that everybody, I'm not talking about taxing the rich, I'm talking about taxing income. You know, there's a lot of students out there that are graduating in this state with twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars in debt from a, you know, some of our four-year public institutions that are extremely worried about getting a job. And I'm sure they would gladly pay a fair income tax. When you increase that income tax just a little bit, you know, nobody loses a job. But when you start unallotting and cutting like we're doing at the Capitol, this police officer here is somebody in public employee that uh, asks me person at the University of Minnesota is going to lose their job. And I think we got to think about that and be fair about it and go back to fair taxes. In the Great Depression, 24 percent, a little more than 24 percent of all the wealth in this country was controlled by the richest one percent. When the unions got strong in this country, and I'm a strong union supporter, in the, after FDR helped them organize and collect the bargaining and National Labor Relations Act was passed, you had only 10% of the wealth in this country controlled by the richest 1% of the people. And now we're back up to over 22%. It might have to do with the fact that our union membership is down to about 10% again in this country. But it's not right that 1% of the people control 22 or better percent of the wealth. And they're the people in wars and even in recessions that make money. They can afford, we can all afford to pitch in if we're working to help get this economy and these students that we have here and that back on their feet. And I think I can convince people of that. One other thing I do want to say is, you know, there's some young people in the bar here this evening that I just want to say something to, and that is, I've been a strong proponent at the Capitol of giving kids a second chance for being kids. I think it's a shame what Congress and a lot of legislatures have done around this country, because I've said publicly on the House floor, if half the laws were in place today, uh, or, or were in place when we were kids that we've put in place today, none of us would be able to be legislators. And you know, what we're doing to, to kids just for being kids and making mistakes and not giving them a second chance is absolutely terrible. Uh, education is a lot more important than incarceration. And while our state uh, doesn't have one of the highest incarceration rates in this country, we're approaching one of the highest probation rates for a number of minor offenses, I think, that we don't need to be putting people through the court systems. Now, you know what, folks? I don't have a million bucks at all. I'm the, not only in, in, in stature, but in financially the little person in this race. But I think I can connect to people. My friend over here said I, I'm a warm Italian. You know, I got a warm heart. I think I can connect to people and bring back 
the greatness that this state has been recognized for for years and years.